Okay, so we're just gonna continue with our emergent floor issues. Um, this one goes perfectly in line with what we did or what they discussed in uh, the morbidity and mortality um, uh, lecture or case report today. Um, so this one is on sepsis. So as we all know, what we study for during um, the step exams or the USMLE exams, is first we start off with SIRS. So I know the answer's up there, but you just wanna tell me what you remember SIRS to be. I'll just go like this, it's not. <laughs> Do you wanna tell me what it is? I'm talking with Anisha, sorry. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, however, in the RCC, if they're saying something of them just come to sit next to you and answer so we can hear what's going on. Okay, sounds good. Anisha, get up here. <laughs> so the source criteria, it is like systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Uh, there should be at least two, two above four, uh, and then those criteria are fever above 38 or hypothermia, uh, less than 36, temperature, tachycardia, like more than 90, tachypnea, uh, more than 20, and then leukocytosis above 2 Okay, perfect. Um, and then does anybody want to kind of say, so once you have SIRS positive, what is the next thing that we usually, uh, what was the next step, I guess, when you're evaluating for infection? Anybody can like unmute themselves and kind of just say what they remember it to be. Okay, I'll just say it. <laughs> so from SIRS, you go to sepsis. Um, sepsis is usually with a SIRS positive and when you have a source of infection. Um, so now that we know it goes from SIRS to sepsis, does anyone remember the third step <laughs> after sepsis? So this is for all the interns. You guys can unmute and kind of say what you think is. Well, I can always just Pick on someone. Okay, that sounds good too. So I'll just show the slide just to make it a little bit easier. So uh, like Anisha said, SIRS so is the criteria there. You have the temperature, the heart rate, the respiratory rate, and the uh, WBC count, which could be like either above 12 or below four. Uh, for sepsis, you needed the definition of having a SIRS positive as well as a source of infection. Um, then it was usually severe sepsis when you had like a new set of like uh, organ dysfunction. So this could have been like the lactate that it says over two or like any renal abnormality or any like liver abnormalities, enzymes and such, like, anything of that sort. Septic shock was what we knew was um, if we weren't able to um, like resolve the symptoms or resolve the hypotension despite giving them fluids and we know the fluids was 30 ml per kg within like the first few hours um, of like initial diagnosis. And I think that's what the um, case report of the m, &M was about too, was that they weren't treated, they had severe sepsis, but there was a lack of initial treatment or just them treating um, acutely and kind of prolonging it. And as the presentation will go on, you'll notice that the most important thing in sepsis is that uh, time is very important and time is of the essence. So you wanna make sure that you, if once you diagnose sepsis, that you treat right away. Um, I wanted to put this in because although at Sparrow, we still kind of follow this a little bit, like the SIRS sepsis, and I think it's likely known as sepsis three. Um, this is kind of what the new, um, uh, the new like literature and stuff is kind of referring to. You have early sepsis, then you have sepsis and septic shock. So there's no such thing as severe sepsis or like SIRS is not used that commonly either. So for severe sepsis, you have no formal di uh, definition, but you have like the two uh, Q-SOFA and the news that they use to evaluate the patient. So for Q-SOFA, it's very simple. You have respiratory rate, ultramental status, as well as systolic blood pressure less than 100. Uh, for the new score, uh, you have a few more, so respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, systolic blood pressure, pulse rate, uh, level of consciousness and temperature. So as you can see, most of these you can kind of determine like just on an initial evaluation or even like without even evaluating the patient and going into the room, you can kind of 
or all of this should be in a chart. You don't need to order CBC or anything to determine versus the SIRS where you needed the white count or you may need it something else. So these are very quick um, differentials or that can help you determine to see if the patient has early sepsis. For the Q so far, you need more than two, uh, a score of two or more. Um, and a score of two or more obviously uh, predicts poor outcomes. And then for the new score, you have kind of like a gradient or a, um, so from zero to four, there's a low risk from five to six medium risk and seven or more, you have a high risk of um, septic shock. Um, I love up to date and <laughs> the charts and up to date. So these are just some of the screenshots. So if you can't find anything in Epic, the best way to do it would just be find it. And you literally have to type it in. It'll give you the score. I mean, for Q so far, you don't really have to type in just because there's three uh, values and you can kind of tell yourself if it has two or more. Um, for the new score, again, it will kind of tell you if you just don't want to think and you want to just put in the values, it's a good way to go too. It's very quick. Um, so I added this, sorry, let me open this up. So for, I'll be honest, for a good amount of time, even though this new score did come out, I didn't pay much attention to it, but now like we do know what it is and we do um, understand. So like, if you see a patient that has a new score of eight, you know that is fairly high. It's right above like seven was a cutoff for high risk of septic shock or mortality. So, you know, and vers versus if you see a patient that has a zero, then you can kind of say, okay, and if you were to prioritize, you would know that you would need to see this patient with A and kind of address any issues, um, any acute issues as soon as possible. Um, so we went from early sepsis to sepsis and the sepsis uh, definition is life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection and the sepsis three as evidenced by the following. So you need to have a source of infection and the infection could just be uh, your clinical judgment. So if you think the patient has um, pneumonia or UTI or whatever it may be, and it hasn't been confirmed by lab, you can still say um, uh, suspicion for infection or anything, and you can still give the patient a diagnosis of sepsis. And then organ dysfunction, it has those criteria, or these are the lab values that we generally use. Um, so the PaO2 versus, uh, sorry, ratio over FiO2 platelet, bilirubin, blood pressures, uh, Glasgow coma scale, and then the renal function. Septic shock. So septic shock, I think, um, is somewhat easy to identify. So this is when you realize a patient has severe sepsis, you give them the antibiotics, you give them the fluids, um, and then you still don't see a response. They're still hypotensive. They're still, uh, whether it be febrile, whatever it may be. So it's a lack of response to the treatment that you initiated um, on initial uh, presentation. Um, some of the most important thing is patients with septic shock have a higher mortality. Um, today, all the data I found was between 40 and 50%, but it sounds like it's more towards 50% um, just from what we heard today. Um, so yeah, the mortality is very high. So uh, this is not one of those things, giving a patient fluids, yes, there's risks of them becoming like having pulmonary edema, they could have other symptoms. So you don't wanna give fluids or start antibiotics, especially if they have a history of like allerg allergies or anything. But once you identify severe sepsis, the two easiest things you can do is start the fluids and start antibiotics. Just because of the high mortality, and I think they mentioned, or I mentioned it in this slide, okay. So time matters, early identification and management in initial hours after sepsis develops, um, improves outcomes. Sepsis is the leading cause of death in the hospitals. Sep sepsis and septic shock kill as many as one in four affected, and it's the leading cause of mortality at Sparrow. Um, definitions we kind of went about, uh, already discussed, so the, um, uh, sepsis three is SIRS uh, infection and organ uh, regulation. So now <laughs> the most common pages that you'll get, especially on night float, um, a nurse will most likely page you is to say that um, she was triggered uh, for cold sepsis for a patient. Uh, what we would, what would we want to do? About 80 to 90% of the time, the uh, nurse has already ordered all the labs and she's just doing a courtesy call and letting you know. But sometimes they actually do call and ask for <laughs> our opinion as if we want to do the labs or not. 
Um, so for them, for nurses, it triggers them. So first of all, nurses have to check the patients and evaluate them for sepsis at the start of their shift. Um, at the start of their shift, any any change between nurses, so halfway through if somebody um, changes or if it gets triggered by the computer saying, hey, you need to evaluate this patient. So as we talked about, any known or suspected infection, like we said, so if, even though nothing has been confirmed, like but we're suspecting and like, for example, an intra-abdominal infection, but we're still waiting for the CT or anything like that, but you suspect like an infection to be there, they can still be positive. Um, and then, so this will trigger um, the nurses uh, protocol, sorry. So this is what they will see. And they will order pretty much everything on this and it will go under the attendings name. So there has been times when in the morning you kind of go back and see, um, like labs or what was done for your patient overnight and you'll see all these labs. So most of the time, like I said, they'll call and let us know. Sometimes if they're busy, they will just kind of order all of these if the patient had any of the search criteria, even though we don't, we shouldn't be kind of following it just because it's not um, as sensitive as the others, but um, they might go ahead if they have a SERS positive as well as a source of infection. Um, so after getting, um, those labs, the nurse's screen will prompt them to also assess for organ dysfunction. So this will go into whether they have severe sepsis or not. And if they do have severe sepsis, it gets logged as time zero. Um, so this is the original screen. They will kind of mark all the things that have a SIRS. They will be asked if there's a concern for infection. So one of the two questions. And then this is like their screen to say if there's any organ dysfunction. So what some of the things we talked about, if they have low blood pressure, if their bilirubin is low, platelets, PTT. So if anything of that gets marked, um, sorry, um, it will prompt them to label it as severe sepsis time zero. And then they, those labs or the sepsis labs don't have to repeat it for 72 hours following time zero. So, and the 72 hours is to give the primary team a chance to reevaluate um, the interventions that they've taken already. So once a patient gets marked with sepsis, you most likely get a page from pharmacy as well if you don't start antibiotics or if you don't start fluids. So within 72 hours, all the interventions that you put in place should be reevaluated. If the patient is not improving, then another time zero will be called and all of these labs will be um, done again. And the most common labs that usually are ordered, like the screen I showed before, is like the CBC, CMP, blood cultures. Um, so sometimes if a nurse does call you overnight and they give you the courtesy of asking you if you want to order these labs, um, quickly look over the patient's chart. And um, if the patient is tachypnic or they're tachycardic, but you know a reason for it, then you don't necessarily need to do labs. Or if they, get, if they got blood cultures done this morning, there's no need to poke the patients unnecessarily because one of the worst things you want is for a new phlebotomist to go into the room and struggle with the patient for an hour when they don't need to. Um, but that's just me. So um, other things that you might want to evaluate, um, the vasopressors and like the pressors and things like that, once it gets into septic shock, you give them the fluids, they don't improve, you call ICU, like the vasopressors and all those things you don't necessarily need to worry about while you're on the floor. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind that the next logical, the next step in the treatment would be to um, start them on pressors to kind of maintain uh, their blood pressure. Um, so for code sepsis, there's two order sets. I'll be honest, I don't generally use it until I had to do this presentation, but it actually looks pretty good. So I would recommend you guys use it. The first one is the order set for, um, please, <laughs> the CIS. So the, so the first one is I, IP, um, so it's IP sepsis treatment. So if the nurse calls and asks, hey, do you want sepsis workup on this patient? And you tell them, okay, yes, I will, but I'll order the labs. If you put in IP sepsis treatment, it'll give you um, all the things that you should normally order that should be included in your first hour or your third hour of workup for a patient who you're, who's septic. So obviously, like we said, CBC, CMP, lactate, 
um, blood cultures, PT, PTT, and then you could do the fluids, but most likely, um, like you wouldn't do electrolyte, you can just do normal fluids or like the uh, normal saline. If they're obese, you need to do ideal body weight versus what they, what they give or what they recommend initially. And this is like a very fast and easy way to do it. You don't have to think, oh, am I forgetting something? And is there an order that I didn't uh, put in? The second option is pathways. So if you, again, I, pathways are actually uh, very helpful, um, especially for COVID, but now I know that there's one for sepsis too. So sepsis too, if you put it in, um, it actually gives you again, like step-by-step -step instructions um, on how to do it. If like, if you've already given fluid and it hasn't helped, um, if their lactate was above four, like what you need to do and, even if you go along the side here, it gives you all the labs. If you didn't do the order set, then you can come here in the pathway and it'll give you the labs that you should be ordering. So for example, if you did your analysis four hours ago, you don't need to do a year analysis, but some of the other things that will remind you and help you uh, to make sure all the proper workup has been done. Um, so those are two things to keep in mind, the IP sepsis uh, treatment, which is an order set, and then the pathway, which is sepsis two. Um, and again, I, like I said, time is very important. So you don't want to delay it or keep it for the morning saying, hey, code sepsis was triggered, but I thought I would ask you guys before I ordered anything. So these are some of the goals that once you initiate fluids or you initiate antibiotics, this is kind of what you're aiming for. This is what you want to see as an improvement for your patient. You want to see like the central venous pressure being within that normal range. It will help to identify is the patient still hypotensive versus not. Most of the time you can't actually evaluate this on the floor. Generally you would need like a central line or something of the sort. The map you can calculate yourself based on like the blood pressure and urine output. Again, uh, central venous saturation, I think you can only um, see in the ICU, but the other two you can evaluate while um, sorry, more on the floor. Um, so this is kind of what we already said about um, the code being triggered every two, every 72 hours. Um, and then I'm going to kind of shift from the orders and labs to your note. Uh, one of the most important things to do as an intern or as a, any resident on the floor would be to document um, what you did, what you, who you discussed it with, and why you did what you did. So if you don't feel like a patient needs to have the entire sepsis workup, you document it in a note um, saying patient has septic workup of this. Um, we do not believe that he is severe sepsis at this time, even though his respiratory uh, rate is elevated. Um, this is what we think is the cause. Like you have to document, otherwise um, in the morning, the other team's not gonna know why the workup wasn't done. And if the, if the patient deteriorates, then it will be on the night team or on the resident on call that kind of did it. Um, so there's actually, believe it or not, a sepsis note in EPIC that you can do. Um, again, I didn't know this how I did this presentation, but if you type in sepsis note, the note will come up. Um, it will prompt you as to all the things that the patient is on. What are the things? I know you can't see it well, and I apologize, but um, it will, it's like the previous one. So what are the search criteria? Is there a source of infection? Is there organ dysfunction? Are they on any fluids? Um, are they on any antibiotics? Once you click it, it actually generates a note for you. Um, and then you can obviously add anything additional that you want, you would want. So yay, case time. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I will read the case and then I'll just kind of ask you guys for the answers. Um, so 42-year-old 42, 42 male with no significant past medical history presents to the medical tent due to lightheadedness. Patient reports a symptoms starting shortly before he finished a five-mile marathon run. Battles on examination equal temperature of 37.4, heart rate of 132, blood pressure 88 over 64, respiratory of 25, and oxygen saturation of, uh, sorry, of 96 on room air. Does this patient have sepsis? No. No. No, okay. Good job, Sumeri. <laughs> so no, this patient does not have sepsis. Uh, how many SIRs or Q uh, SOFR criteria does this patient meet? All three, four. So how many SIRs? 
BP low or as per US 25. So he is meeting the criteria, but uh, this is a no, not a case of sepsis. Okay, so how many? Remember how we talked about SIRS and QSOFA? So QSOFA has three criteria and SIRS has four. I mean, yeah, so how many of each does he meet? The pressure is low, one. Respiratory rate is high, 20, 25. Mm, temperature is 37.4. Two. Okay, so two SIRS and two of SOFA, perfect. Um, so case two, does anyone wanna read this one? Just because I'm tired of talking. Okay, I can read this one too. So 64 year old female with past medical history of cervical cancer stage four is admitted to the hospital for an extensive pelvic surgery in order to remove the tumor. Initially post-surgery, she's doing well. However, starting uh, post-operative day three, she becomes tachypnic, uh, normally 16 to 18 breaths per minute. Now she's at 22, 26. Temperature also increases from normal to 39.2. Patient reports not feeling well and denies any discomfort. Um, surgical wound site shows no signs of infection. Later that evening, her blood pressure drops from 136 to 101, 52. What is the, what is your, plen 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 <laughs> what is your diagnosis? Is <laughs> um, anyone wanna, you guys have to come up unfortunately if you wanna answer. I'll just pick. I'll take this one. Um, so she does meet two of the SERS criteria. Her respiratory rate is greater than 20, temperature is greater than 38.6, I believe. Um, so you, she could have, she could be septic with a possible infection since she just had surgery. So you're saying the possible diagnosis is uh, sepsis That's or severe, what would you say? Um, it's I don't know what her map is. I haven't calculated it, but it could be severe sepsis if her map is less than 65. Okay, very good. So just like you said, she meets SIRS criteria with the two positive tachypnea and the elevated blood pressure. She had the resilient um, operation, so that could be the source of the infection. And then she became hypotensive. Um, I know it's not easy just to calculate, but I made sure that the map was below 65. So she meets the criteria for severe sepsis. Uh, what is the next step in management for this patient? Okay, he's so speak up. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So I know I've been kind of stressing it a lot, but the two things that you need to do if you check on up to date or anything is fluids and antibiotics, even when you're studying for step three. Um, so you need to initiate antibiotics within three hours and fluids within one hour. Um, of any severe diagnosis, severe sepsis diagnosis, um, which I totally mixed right now. So IV flu is within the first three hours and then antibiotics within the first hour. Um, and then the 30 milliliter per kg and then the antibiotics obviously should be brought unless you know the source of the infection. So if you know it's a UTI or if there's um, bacteremia with staph, you want to make sure that you cover everything. So um, don't just pick random broad spectrum antibiotics. If there's bacteremia with staph, make sure dank is included. If you're thinking about uh, abdominal infection, you want to make sure like anaerobes, grand negatives are included in the in the coverage. And then obviously do the order set as well and order all the associated uh, labs with it. So patient remains hypotensive despite fluid resuscitation. The following morning, she becomes short of breath and the chest x-ray shows concerning for pulmonary edema, which was absent on admission. What is the next step in management? Um, Adolfo? Yeah, so on the context of sepsis, could we be considering arts here? Okay. Or despite fluid resuscitation. The other thing is that maybe we did um, a volume overload of her. So that's another thing we to consider. So how would you, 
if you saw this patient, he, she got the fluid, she got the antibiotics, but now she's deteriorating. What would you do? She's still hypotensive. So, yeah, so we just got her impressors. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So whenever in doubt, <laughs> call ICU senior or your senior. Um, and then, yeah, so if they remain hypotensive despite getting uh, fluid, so now they're in septic shock, so they didn't improve. Uh, you would stop the IV fluids, one of the first thing you would do, especially if the chest x-ray is showing concern for pulmonary edema, their oxygen requirements are going up, you don't want to continue with that. Um, and then obviously talk with ICU, let them know, and then they can kind of take it from there. But the whole idea is when you see someone on the floor, um, like the uh, M&M like kind of stress, like you want to make sure that you start with treatment, which is fluids and antibiotics right away for any sepsis patient. This time is very critical, so, and I believe that is it. Any questions? No? Perfect.